Hey, it's Derek. I don't usually do introductions to the podcast, but I don't know. I felt like I needed to for this one because Sasha Fred Jones is the guest of this podcast. And I was so inspired by this conversation. I it didn't it kind of went in a different direction where I would have thought it's about how to listen to music. And it is fundamentally about that. But it goes on this journey of him exploring and talking about his career as a music journalist, a reporter, um, most notably his tenure at, at The New Yorker really much defined and crystallized his method. And what if you make it all the way through the episode, you'll really hear how you can listen to music so intensely, so passionately, and still have the uh, wonder and love for it that you had as 16, 17. I think it, it really is like almost like a fountain of youth type thing. I relate to it a lot because the more I think about and talk about music, the more I realize just how wonderful it is and will be, but also how much there is to learn that people think I know a lot of things. You know, I think it, it's accepting that you don't, you will never know enough things. And that is the theme of this episode. And I really hope you enjoy it. I'm going to re-listen to it again and again, I'm sure. Enjoy. It is Derek G Speaks Volumes, or in this case, Sasha Ferrer Jones Speaks Volumes. Uh, I have a special <laughs> guest in the studio today. Um, a new friend, actually, um, who I guess in, in many ways was a supporter um, earlier on. And um, Sasha, your name came up and I... I recognized it, but I didn't immediately know how. And uh, and then I thought about it for a long time and then realized that um, I have uh, quite a, a long history with um, your family name and the um, the type foundry of your brother. <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> Which is the, why it all connected. And then it was all like, oh, this is all making sense now. This name yep. kind of floats around different places. But thank you so much for joining to do a bit of an introduction to Sasha. A one of the most influential and important music commentators, um, I was going to say, of our time of of uh, you know has done so much writing and has been observing and thinking about music for you know a good amount of time that has contributed in so many broad, deep ways that. There's like so much stuff out there to read and to, to enjoy and is a, is a brilliant writer and is someone that I, we've spoken recently and I felt had to come on at some point because I, I'm still unpacking how I think about music and I think you've thought about it a whole great deal. So welcome. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you for that lovely introduction. It's uh, nice to be here in my spot. You're, all, you're in Australia, aren't you? Yeah, I'm in Sydney. That's crazy. I'm in New York. <laughs> I, uh, I didn't get to spend enough time in, in New York when I lived there, but, um, you know, it's definitely somewhere I want to get back to. And uh, it will be here. Definitely feel like a kinship to in many ways, that city. So, um, cool. but yeah, thank you. So the, po the purpose of this podcast, I like to have a, uh, a topic, a thesis or something to explore. And, right. and um, we've been chatting back and forth about mm -hmm. where we where we could explore whether it's music criticism and commentary whether it's right. you know how music has evolved over time but i i think I, I really landed on something where i just was thinking about all of that all of that thinking and all of that experience that you have comes down to and this is the topic how you listen to music right it's it's something that's in the air. It's something that you critically analyze. It's something that you enjoy. It's something that you observe. It's cultural impact you think about for a long time. And I kind of wanted to break that down. And okay. and I, I, I'm sure it's not like a methodical thing where you're, you know, you have to do it in the same way. But I think that it's, I would love to understand how Sasha Fred Jones listens to music and how therefore you know, your mind has like operated in this space to, to, you know, really think about artists and impacts and culture and 
and, and great work and terrible work and everything in between. So mm-hmm. I guess let's start let's start with like you know from from a music fan to a music uh commentator writer how, where where was that jumping off point for you um i'll give you uh just a tiny bit of background just the, the relevant stuff cuz um it was definitely not uh it wasn't just not a direct path it wasn't even something i was going to do um when i was a kid i wrote plays um then i did theory and film in college and but mostly i was you know i wanted to start a band and i did uh there was one in college and then the band that i worked the most with ui started in about 1990 and that's that was the only plan i was just going to be in a band um i had bailed on theater and i wasn't really writing theory or any i didn't write anything for a minute and then um we Uli was playing a show in about 94 at the old knitting factory which used to be on houston street um it's been in a bunch of different locations i don't know where it is now um i don't know if it closed during the pandemic or anything um and michael dorf who started the knitting factory went on to start a uh, city winery so anyway um a writer I really like named Ann Marlowe came to see our band. Um, uh, this anecdote is in the memoir. So for those of you who buy the memoir in October. Nice. It's called Earlier, coming from Semiotext. Um, y- my apologies because you will read this anecdote in there. So you're, you're going to be no really preview. Bored, <laughs> bored at that point. Um, anyway, Ann was very forthright. Ann is not really like anyone else. Incredible writer. Anyway, she was like, no, you guys suck. I, I'm not going to write about you. And I was like... Okay, and she said, but you look like a writer. Maybe you'd like to write for my zine. And, and she wrote for the Village Voice. I didn't know she had a zine, and she was actually just starting it. And I was like, well, what do you want me to write? And she said, well, you and Andy, uh, Andy Hawkins, guitar player in an amazing band called Blind Idiot God, we were at the bar talking about lo-fi culture and saying, like, ah, oh, man, this is bullshit. Like, why are these people using fucking cassette decks and, like, they're trying to make it sound authentic and weird, and that's bullshit, which is, you know, classic young man nonsense i mean it, it's more complicated than that and there's nothing wrong with using a, a boom box to record your music mountain goats shout out shout out probably all the all the people we're making fun of i probably liked but you know we were just <laughs> young men hopped up on a bunch of bullshit and like you know his band is very hi-fi and has a huge hu- there's a whole story about their the truck they had to have built to hold their gear um so the opposite end of the spectrum, literally the opposite end of the spectrum from recording a boombox with a boombox is Blind Idiot God, the most expensive, biggest equipment of all time. Um, anyway, so I was rambling with him and Ann said, write that down. So I was like, all right, I'm sure. And that was the very first piece I wrote. And so I was in every issue of Pretty Decorating and there were about five of them. There were only five of them. Um, she, a couple of years ago, gave me copies of them again because I had lost them. And that's sort of where it started. Grill Marcus read something I wrote about Free Kitten and wrote Anna a note. And then Ann Powers of the Village Voice said, we're going to do a, a pullout supplement about post-rock and can you write about your band? And I was like, okay. And so I wrote for her and then it just went from there and people kept asking me and I, I, it worked, you know. And I, in the beginning it was just, you know, a way to write and I liked having a thing I had to do and a reason to write and I got like free uh, they weren't even records they were just advanced cassettes at that point Um, and that was really as far as I thought about it and it just sort of developed from there and The Wire let me write some stuff and Spin was a a place for a minute and uh, I was briefly at the New York Post but The Voice The Voice and The Wire were the kind of the two main places for a while and then it just sort of developed from there. And I was mostly concentrating on the band, but the writing was a fun thing to do. And I, th- I thought about it more in terms of writing and being a sort of a part of the community because people knew me, in, this sounds weird now, but initially just because I was in this band. So I was prim- prim- primarily the guy in Ui, and I did this writing and, and it wasn't obviously until the New Yorker gig that it kind of became something bigger and that's a whole different story which i'm happy to tell but i'm going to stop now so you can say stuff do you uh, audio blocks 
No, no, not at all. I, what did? What What do you think it was about your writing as someone that didn't consider themselves a writer? That kind well, no, of. No, I definitely consider myself a writer. I just didn't. Right, right, right. I didn't write about. I, I I didn't plan to be a music critic. I see. I think it was that I wasn't a music critic is maybe what made it feel different to people because my. I didn't read, I've never read a lot of music criticism. I mean, now I suppose I have, but at the time I was just not interested in, I don't know, I've never been particularly interested in the ranking sort of discourse. And mm. I I was very much immersed in what the band had to do. So I was really just concentrating on shit I liked that felt relevant um, to the work we were doing. So I, I wasn't, I wasn't super aware of being a generalist. I just happened to like a lot of different kinds of music, but I didn't write about like a that much typical guitar rock really ever. Um, I mean, the early, I'm trying to remember the early pieces for The Voice were like Ronnie Size and AC Alone and uh, Timbaland was someone I wrote about early. I wrote about him early on for The Wire. Um, and then I did one for The New York Times Magazine. It was just the stuff I was interested in. And that happened to maybe fill a need. I think the, the story, to jump ahead a little bit to make it make a little bit more sense and be more specific is I had what I wanted to do. And that had to do initially just with reporting. Because the very first thing that made me mad about music writing is that it was done by people who weren't musicians who didn't understand how music was made. And they were making all these technical mistakes when they would describe things that were or were not samples and stuff about recording that I thought was kind of obvious. But, you know, I, I would get mad. I'd be like, the people who review fiction are generally fiction writers. And when they ask, a, a, you know, when they write about scientific issues, they get a scientist. But when it's music, you've just got some jag off you know, complaining in his bedroom. And I'm like, why don't you get someone who at least will not describe the material process incorrectly? So, you know, I, that was my attraction. I wanted to report. So when it was time to do a piece, and I think this maybe came in useful with The New Yorker later, like, I just wanted to get the stuff right. You know, the one of my first things I remembered was, you know, uh, there was a piece of writing like in the mid 80s, talking about Cool G Rap and Rakim and Big Daddy Kane. And making it sound like they were all this like equal cloud of, 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 you know, they were all equally important and they happened at the same time. And I was like, no, 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 no. Rakim came and then these other guys got put on and maybe they were developing things around the same time. But Rakim was the person who changed how you could land on the bar line and everything sounded different after him. And, it, you know, he was the Charlie Parker. It wasn't like everyone hit it once. It was him and then everyone else. Wow. Um, and I was like, well, you know, if I can record this stuff accurately, I mean, record as and report it and write it down accurately and, you know, and establish an historical record, then people later will get things wrong less often. That's kind of like where I started with it. It wasn't about, it really wasn't about anything other than that and the ability to write, which I just enjoy doing. And so in terms of like being part of a cohort or ranking stuff or getting into some bigger criticism thing, that was never really... It was that plus getting free stuff, like, <laughs> which we was, all love. <laughs> yeah, and you know, and the pay the pay was okay. It was in some ways it was pretty good back then, but I, it, that was not. Pri I had day jobs. I worked in offices and stuff. I wasn't really yeah. thinking about it like a career until 2004 when I got an actual job doing it. Um, That's really interesting because when when you spoke about your early story of of Uwe and. Um, being a musician, it does, I was going to say it does feel like it's important. I wouldn't necessarily, but I feel like that's the, it, it kind of defines the core of how you express and operate. And I feel like uh, alongside that, what you said about like documenting and the history of it and getting it right is important because, you know, not to jump around too much, but I know that we spoke offline about like, and I've heard you speak about it before as well, about ranking and the internet and all that sort of stuff and how fraught mm -hmm. it can be. And it feels like fundamentally you are a musician that wants to document music's place in the world through, through your lens that is, I guess, trying to paint a brought a bigger picture it's not about Sasha and like I think this is a 10 out of 10 it's about like what I've observed and why this is important is that safe to say yeah I think 
I mean, I don't. I should also make it clear that I think that anyone can write beautifully about music. And if you're not a musician, but you're super curious and energetic, you can, as many people do, they, you can write and, and report beautifully. So I don't think you have to be a musician. I'm just saying that's where I, mm. I became aware of the errors that later, I didn't even know the word fact checking. Like I just became aware of what later when I worked at the New Yorker, people would, you know, ask me for sources and I'd have to give the fact checkers little pieces of paper. And I'd be like, oh, this is what, okay, this is what it's called. But I just wanted things to be historically accurate. So you can be at any point in the process. I mean, I think the way I think about it now at my advanced old age is that, um, and because of years and years of going back and forth, being a musician, being a writer, then being a writer with other musicians and then sort of this sort of kaleidoscopic kind of like back and forth is that um, and hearing musicians talk about what they like about writing and, and how, and then thinking about how I like and don't like it and often don't care because I find it very satisfying making records. And it, this sounds a little bit weird, but I'm not super worried about reviews when I make music because it's so satisfying that if you, anytime I put out a record or I'm involved in a band putting out a record, like, at that point, like, I am so happy and I've had such a good time that, like, I don't give a fuck what anyone says about the records. And it's fine for the critical process to go on. But what I was going to say about the entire ecosystem is, like, there's this conversation, there's this community. And uh, it was Taja, uh, Taja Cheek of Lorraine, who said this great thing a couple of years ago when we were talking about how... I, I think I was saying something sort of dismissive about writers, and she was like, no, no, I need... I need to hear from a writer sometimes to help like put it in context and sort of, you know, give the other part of the story because everyone's trying to process so much stuff out there and to figure out not whether or not they like it because everyone can figure that out without, I think, my help or anyone's help. It's more like, what is this thing and how does it relate to this other thing? And often a writer, not so much now, but um, intermittently writers or, or, or people in the audience, people can react and say... You know, like, I th I'm thinking of Doja Cat's Moo. Maybe not, you know, the thing you thought I was going to bring up, but, like, that bounced up out of wherever it was, 2018. And, like, it was so hilarious and sweet and funny and great. And, you know, the audience kind of put it in a, in a place where they were saying, like, we like this person, but also we like the fact that there's this kind of clever and kind of, like, what the hell is this? But... People really wanted wanted that, and and the and the reaction of people, not necessarily criticism, but just the conversation, helped put this person in a place where I don't think it would have been as rich without people reacting to that person. And so, and over time, especially as as younger people bring back older stuff, which is one of my favorite things, is seeing how stuff that I did or didn't have a relationship with. You'll see, I don't know, watching people go bananas for Luther Vandross has been really fun for me. Or, you know, going nuts over George Benson. Or there's like things that were in a certain place before. It's also interesting to see the stuff that doesn't get brought back up. Like when I was young, Elvis Costello seemed to be of massive importance. And I still love Elvis, but like I don't hear people talk about him almost ever. Mm. Um, and that doesn't mean he's not important. But these things shift and move and things, you know, now you like you're the one for me by D train or something like, um, keep, you know, what is it? Got to keep keeping on like these songs will pop up out of nowhere and people will love it. They'll be like, Oh man, I love those synth pads. And I'll be like, damn, that was just one of a hundred great songs that year. But you know, the, the conversation brings it back into focus. People are like, well, now we love these DX seven stabs and these, you know, these little drum machines. And like, that's, people are vibing off this in some ways more intensely than they did that summer when it was just like a six week period. And then we were on to the next thing. Cause mm. when I was a kid, you know, in the eighties, that was a very intense moment of production. And so stuff was just flying by and you'd come back, you know, you'd come out of JNR music world and there'd be a new meat puppets record and just stuff was just coming out, bang, bang, bang. And like, um, and it was a very sort of wo woolly spaghetti answer to the question. But anyway, in terms of like, why be a critic is that there's, this conversation, and and it's less about the ranking for me, not that I don't like things more than other things, obviously I do, I do but it's it's helping helping each other situate things. And I mean, there are people like Fantano who do ranking and I, I find it interesting to watch them. I don't want to do it that way, but I like 
like the little sort of like tornado of activity that will come up around, you know, doing the little TikTok thing where you do like this with your head and you mm-hmm. use the albums, like watching people in the comments get, you know, super, you know, people 30 years younger than me being like, how could you say that that about like the third Nas record versus the second Wooden Tops record? And I'm like, this is amazing. Like, I that's not even a real competition, but the passion, it tells you something. It's like, okay, yeah, yeah. watching the cluster of people like, wow, okay people care as much about Loveless today as when it came out. Cause believe me, everyone cared a, sh- a lot about that record instantly. And it's yes. like this flat line, like S- Spiderland by Slint, like people cared about it a lot and never stopped caring. Other things go down, other things go up, but there are certain things when you check back into that conversation, you're like, okay, like whether or not I give a shit about, I don't know, fill in the blank. There are bands I've never even listened to like Primal Scream. I don't even know what they sound like. That's the guy who played drums for Jesus and Mary Chain. But like, I was paying attention to some other band like The Laws or Stone Roses, and I didn't have any more room for English yeah. people. So I literally don't know what Primal Scream sound like. That's not a statement. That's just like, I got X amount of time before I die. And so seeing a bunch of people go bananas about whatever Screamadelic or whatever their big album is, like, it hasn't actually gotten me to listen to them yet. But, you know, like, I may eventually be like, okay, I should probably pay attention to that. And that's different than somebody writing a, a really passionate essay about something that I absolutely never cared about. Mm. Um, but it's, to me, it's all part of the same constellation because I want, I just sort of want the whole hairy conversation and people seem to, you know, bemoan the, like the lack of the authoritative critic now. And I, I couldn't care less. I want the, I want the largest number of voices saying a range of brilliant to dumb things because that entire, you know, that entire conversation taken in 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 as, as one thing helps you see what it means. Because often, you know, we react to things and we don't know why we like them. We don't need to know why we like them at all. There's no need to. Mm-hmm. But it is interesting and really satisfying to all of a sudden be like, oh, I do love how that person says that one word. Like, that's a good point. Mm-hmm. You know, watching people go bananas about uh, this rap group that I, I can't blow. Um, who have, uh, what's that one? The big hit. Um, yes. where they, they filmed the video in a, in a, in a diner. And I used to love that song mm. and I forgot about it. And then watching younger people go bananas about it. And, and like the rapping is so, so fucking good. And it's such a great sample. And it's like, it's got almost like an outcast level of in- rhythmic interplay. And like, I just forgot. I just, you know, I love that record. And then, I'm sure within a year I'd forgotten I even owned it. And I love moments like that, seeing things come back. You're, I swear my mind has gone through like 10 different questions <laughs> during, Sorry. during that passage. No, no, it's like so amazing. I think I love how you're talking about the conversation. I love how you're talking about in many ways, uh, music journalists or reporters being translators of sorts and giving people the words that, they might not have been able to articulate at that time for what they're feeling or making sense of something as your, your editor said, and kind of putting it in context. I think that is super crucial. I think some something that I've recently, uh, and I, we could, we could go there, but I think something that I found really interesting and inspiring about your voice within all this is that you have a lot of optimism and wonder, considering that you are still um, a very influential music um, presence, and there right. are no, there are more cr- critics than ever. Um, mm-hmm. You know, we, when we spoke recently, you talked about myself and like popping out of nowhere, and and right. there's like these ranking TikTok filters, and there's people coming on here that are you know, telling you the top 10 out best albums of all time. And, and, right. and to me, as someone that's still new to this, I'm like, whoa, like I might've come out of nowhere, but I feel like I've, I've done a lot of work uh, to, to kind of like have formed some opinions and, right. and for you to have kind of the optimism to see that these voices are an important contribution or maybe not like how, how, where does your mind sit that feels like there's there's more is more and that this is a good thing yeah i have a i have okay so there's a very 
important distinction. I've only figured this out in the last couple of years during the pandemic. I'm, I love music. I love music as text. I love writing. I love getting paid for it. That's a whole n another thing which we should probably leave out of it because it's, it's too big a thing to get into. Um, but my primary interest is people. That's what I'm interested in. Um, I, music is interesting to me because people make it. Now, that's not how a lot of people who write about music feel, not, and not a lot of musicians, I mean, no, that's true. Some musicians feel that way, some don't. Um, so, like, for instance, I'll blow some smoke up your ass, why not? You came on to TikTok, and there you were with, you know, you were you had the clip speakers, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and I was just like, oh. And I was writing the speaker piece at that point. I was like, whoa, okay, this cat knows about these speakers. Like, mm. that's interesting. It would seem very, like... Of course, I was like, okay, the, the phone is spying on me, and it heard me say Klipsch, and so it <laughs> showed it to this guy. But I was like, oh, and he's talking about it in kind of an interesting way. He's not a douche at all, and a lot of people in that world are douchey, my lord. Uh, oh, yeah. I, <laughs> Horrible. I'm not going to get into Don't that. that. One, one guy tried to, t tried to prove to me that audio files weren't assholes by sending me multiple emails calling me an asshole, which was kind of <laughs> Anyway, um, but I was like, okay, this, you know, I liked your sensibility. I was like, I have no idea what kind of music this guy listens to, but I like, I like the way he talks. And this is why I think the people who do, when I hear writer writers like me or, I, you know, whatever people from my cohort talking down to people on YouTube or TikTok, I'm like, honestly, I think these guys are doing, and a lot of them are women, a lot of these people are doing something much harder than writing because you get so much. It's like when I, wa I watch Survivor obsessively because one of the things I love is that over 20, 30 hours of watching this group of people, you're going to know what someone is like. All the editing in the world can't really change who someone is. Five, 10 minutes, yeah, you can make someone seem like something, but you watch a bunch of episodes, you're going to know who they are. And so the people who present themselves on video, people like Fantano from day one, who I think has a great sense of humor about himself and what he does, mm. like... You get to you get a lot more information than me just behind the screen on the page. Like so, people who do what you do, like if someone is doing what the, the kind of work you're doing, but they're off putting, like that's that's instantly like a no go. But if they seem like interesting in a bunch of different ways, because there's so many different kinds of information coming through. There's the idea you're expressing, how you're expressing it, but there's also like what does his apartment look like? And like, is he condescending or is he friendly? And like, is he open to things? Does he seem like he's very full of himself? And like, mm -hmm. this could be a cooking video. It could be any, all the people online doing this stuff. You know, you get these incredible, like out of nowhere, you'll find someone who, you know, have no idea who they are, but like you listen to them talk for 60 seconds and you're getting a lot of information. They, they you know, they seem to know what they're talking about. They're enthusiastic, they're open-minded. And all of a sudden, I'm more interested in that person than some random person writing that I've never read before, who I would have to read for a couple of months and years to really get to know them. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I think doing video is very hard. I think there's a lot of information in there. It's very hard to be like someone that you can deal with, you know, because if someone is off putting on video, like it's you can't come back from that. You're instantly like, no way, not interested, you know. So I, I think it's a really it's a really democratic form. Like you can get someone to watch a 30 second video and, and you know, there's this weird bias. Of, it's funny that people who write about popular culture then are like, Oh, you know, we only, you know, we want the really great critics. And I'm like, if anything, if, if you've grown up like watching TV and listening to popular music, you should be open to the idea that someone would hop up in front of a camera mm. and be really interesting. There's that, that really grouchy woman who holds the microphone and like, she's kind of angry all the time. <laughs> And she had what she calls them like fast, irresponsible, lazy reviews. <laughs> and she's great. And then there's uh, another woman who's super like enthusiastic and goes through a bunch of shit. I think you interviewed her. I forget yeah, her name. Margot. Yes, Margot. She's a, awesome. There's an, uh, yeah. a young woman named Liz who's going through a 500 albums list. I don't know where she got the list from, but she's very deadpan and hilarious. And like, I love that. I, and I love that she break, puts like, she's got a bit going like, Every album is ranked against some album I've never heard of. I think by the, the Veronicas or something. Is it, is it better than... I mean, I'm getting it wrong, maybe. But, you know, I love that. That the people can just jump up and do all of that at the same time. Like, I love... Honestly, I prefer that kind of chaos. Like, I open my... I open up TikTok and I'm like, whoa, here's a brand new 
expert out of nowhere. And like, mm. I, I love like, I love it when they got some fight into them and they're going to like go against, you know, received wisdom. And they're like, fuck this stupid book. Fuck this list. I'm going to tell you. And I'm like, yeah, go for it. Like, I would much rather hear someone do that out of nowhere than read someone I've read a million times or read myself or even read anything. Cause you know, I, I love the idea. I love the idea where well, it's not an idea. It's a fact that history is this roiling kind of changing sea and, you know, stuff that I foolishly thought was important or I care about gets mangled and, and reformed by new listeners. Mm-hmm. And, you know, sometimes they agree with me a hundred percent. Sometimes someone will be like, Oh my God, the beat and vitamin C by can is incredible. And I'm like, yeah, it is. But I'm like, that's, that's obvious. And then someone will, you know, point out something I'd never thought of, or, mm-hmm. you know, sometimes consensus is fun. Like you'll see, I'll see the same James Brown clip I've seen a thousand times and I'll just see a new person freaking out about it. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. Like, I know you know, one. <laughs> it, it goes, it goes, it, goes on and on and on and i sort of like the the endlessness of the of that format not that i don't want to read i like reading's great we interrupt this very wonderful episode to shout out and provide information on this week's sponsor which happens to be the sponsor of the podcast turntable lab and let me tell you a bit about them shall i they've been around for more than 20 years in the space of audio gear and records and is the trusted source, many would say, in in the realms of turntable setups and accessories. And I like this line that they say, everything for beginners, both beginners and hi-fi enthusiasts, which it makes a lot of sense because you can go there for the nerdiest, most specific things, or you can go there to be like, I wanted my first turntable. I don't know what to do and what to buy. I want to buy my first needle. I don't know what to do or to buy. Turntable Lab is the place to go. You can check it out at turntablelab.com. They also have the lab, which is a part of their site, which has over 100,000 records. So if you want a record and you're buying some accessories for your turntable, it's all there. Why wouldn't you? It's like the old record stores. They used to sell, you know, speaker cable as well. What happened to that? You can take advantage of their four or more deal where you can take 10% off when you purchase four or more records also. So, you know, a little kicker as well. TurntableLab.com. You can also go to TurntableLab.com forward slash forward slash Derek, where I've handpicked a few things that you might like or be interested in. Headphones I've used and loved. Record table, the record table, turntable that I own that you might want to check out as well. It's all there. It's all love. It's Turntable Lab. Back to the episode. How does it feel to be a music journalist and have have thought and contributed a lot to, um, as you say, the um, the time of, of what, what it meant right. and you, you consider certain things important? And then, like you said, things... Elvis Costello falls, not falls right. away, but is, I've thought about this too, about like, how come you don't hear much about this ex artist? Um, yeah. How does it feel when you, you feel like this is forever, this artist, this album, this is so oh. important. And then over time, is, t- is time right that it's looked back and being like this or or do people, things get lost in the fray? Is there a moment in time where there's like a, a consensus because there's a trend on TikTok that's, that pushes this artist that way and another? Like, how do, how do you feel about that? I mean, the reason I said that I'm interested in people is that partially has an historical um, valence, as we used to say uh, in the 80s. Um, like, think about something like ragtime, okay? So ragtime was a big deal when it happened. And it, and it blends into the earliest days of, well, kind of everything. It bleeds into blues and jazz and all these moments. And it's important. And then there's like this crazy, wacky moment in the 70s. My, like, my dad loved ragtime. And, you know, the sting was this moment where Scott Joplin, the music, um, this beautiful music comes back. But, like, ragtime, I'm going to go out on a limb here absolutely no disrespect to Scott Joplin and, and the Ragtime crew, but like people don't give a shit about Ragtime. Like they just don't. It, it's one of those forms that just died. And I'm sure there's a revival somewhere, but like, and it has nothing to do with the music being good or bad. It has to do with like, there are historical moments that, that come and go, 
you know, ragtime was incredible, but whatever, whatever point it was, whatever it was getting done for the people is now getting done through something else. So it is neither bad nor good that we don't have like a lot of ragtime in our lives now. Um, I loved it as a kid, but um, I, I don't think music is something that can be gotten wrong. And I don't think the canon is something that anyone should spend a lot of time worrying about one way or the other, because I have seen over and over, and this is maybe a, a big advantage of aging, because 20 years ago, I probably did have some kind of more kind of like angry Arthur Fist kind of like, mm, uh, we need the real hip hop, bro. You know, like I probably had kind of some dumb ideas about like, I don't know, DJ Premier and what, you know, what was the right way to make hip hop or whatever the fuck I was thinking. Or if you don't listen to the meters, you're going to go to hell or something. And I don't think any of that now because I've seen so many young musicians just out of a clear blue sky, like fall in love with crazy intense experimental music like Alien Radig or out of nowhere, they'll start playing music and they'll be absolutely deep into really out jazz out of like a, a you know zero to 60 like one day they're listening to dave bowie and the next day they're making like spiritual jazz like it's all there in people people are going to figure it out and and music is an incredibly fluid and flexible thing and i swear to god every day and i obviously i get grouchy and i'm like oh man i wish somebody wrote lyrics like robert forster or like oh, i wish someone was you know had the intensity of nita simone and pardon me almost without fail within a week or two, I will find exactly that. I will stumble into, you know, I think Phoebe Bridgers is a great lyricist. I think um, there are a bunch of people who sing now with an intensity. I sometimes am watching a show, it doesn't matter what it is. And I, and I, and, and this is one thing that's great online is like, there's no, there is no dearth ever of people who can sing and play their asses off. Like I, I think the, the effect of journalism can be often be really unhelpful you know like it's hard to get my mind to unseat miles davis and michael jackson and prince but what i'm about to say is actually i think is true there are plenty of people that talented now you're going to say hold on a second a prince and i'm like well what happens is that people are given attention and money and budgets and exposure and the critical machine repeat stories and it reinforces five stars, sign of the times. And these are people I love. Like I love these recording artists, but I genuinely believe that there are people as talented as all, all three of those people. And like whether or not they get put on and whether or not they get shine and resources, that's just historical mayhem and the unfairness of life. Um, if you really do spend enough time in musical communities, not at home, listening to like the same records, but going out in the world and meeting people and seeing musicians, especially in places like Rio or, or New Orleans, play, you know, places where music is just like dripping from the walls. Like you'll see people that talented. You will absolutely see people with the same level of talent. Um, but, you know, they didn't necessarily want to have a recording career. It's a brutal, weird business and it doesn't seem to make anyone happy. And the more successful you get, the worse it gets. So um, I don't know. I'm wandering away from the farm here with this point. No, but I feel like it's, in many ways, like I, you know, as you can tell, like I, I very much respect what you do, and I, it feels like in many ways, like I'm speaking to a, 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 a future me in many senses, because like what has happened over for me over the last couple of years, especially with the platforms that start I built. Swimming. If you're going to be future me, start swimming earlier. <laughs> no, I need, I do need to actually do yeah, that. Do that. Um, uh, I guess the more I dig into it. And the more I think right. about it, the more I realize I, how little I know. And the more I realize, like you said, like- Well, that's, that's, the position to, that's the position to go with. I think there are two kinds of, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I guess I did. Um, there are two kinds of ways of growing up. And I think as you look at people, you'll see this, is that especially with males, the, there's, there's like a fork in the road. And like one way of growing up is, and, and living the rest of your life out whatever the midpoint is for you, for anyone, is like, I know everything and it's my job from now on to tell everybody how much I know. Or you can be like, I've realized that I basically don't know shit and I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna ask questions and learn. And one of, the, one of the ways I discovered that was, I wrote a, an article for the New Yorker about Led Zeppelin, a band that is very close to the top of my personal heap. 
I just fucking love Led Zeppelin and I always have and I always will. And I don't I don't want to fucking hear anything from anyone who doesn't like Led Zeppelin. Get the fuck out of here. <laughs> if you if you think you like music and you don't like Led Zeppelin, you're a moron. I was sounding very like I was sounding too one worldy and I, I just want to put a little asshole in there. Like fuck you. If you don't like Led Zeppelin, fuck no, you. I, I'm here for that, yeah. Now entirely. But but look where this leads you. The hubris is terrible. I wrote I wrote this piece and Long story short, there was a thing. I was I was abroad. It, it like it was early internet days. It wasn't super porous back and forth. It was one time there, one time in New York. We were crashing this column because Led Zeppelin played the show at the O2 Arena. They got back together with you know for that one show with Jason with Bonham's kid. And the fact checker I think was new. I was at that point I was probably hungover, and I was like, oh yeah, no, no, that's right. And and, and there are a couple of things in the column that are completely wrong about like Jimmy uh, Page's guitars and amps. And insanely, I said there wasn't a bass line in Misty Mountain Hop, even though I have covered that song on bass in a band. Like just like total clams, I fucked it up. And I did that because I thought I knew everything in the world about Led Zeppelin, just because I loved them. And I, and that was a very humbling moment, got angry letters, deserved, totally deserved. And I was like, wow, okay. Loving something doesn't mean I actually know anything about it you know and whatever i think i know I i'm never gonna know everything i just saw someone a young woman two days ago on tiktok talking about going to california the song by led zeppelin and you know mentioning the Joni stuff i knew but there was like one little thing in there that i had never heard i you know i i, I know the story of that song pretty well and um and how they talked about Joni and I don't, I'm not remembering what it is, but there was one fact in there about like, and there was a night they went to a bar or something. I'm getting it wrong, but I am now of the position that like, I want to hear the story 10 times. I want to read the book three times. I want to re-interview people because something is going to come up. And now it is my position going into a piece like that. Like, oh boy, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to screw something up. I'm going to be like, or I'm going to just think I know like, oh yeah, yeah. Like when I did the Alien Radique piece for Art Forum, there was this part in her life in the early days that was really interesting to me because I was like, there's like six, seven years go by. And this is somebody who also didn't record or even put out records really for a lot of, you know, a chunk of her career, you know, just a wild career. And there was like a lot of time in there that didn't, wasn't accounted for in the sixties. And I was like, she's in New York for a year. That doesn't seem right. And and she, although I've, I went to meet her in, in Paris and we had corresponded, she was in kind of a bad mood when we were doing that piece. I don't know why. And she was like, I'll answer your questions. And then she didn't want to. And I was like, okay, I, all right, I'm sorry, Ms. Radig. I don't know why you're in a bad mood, but you're a human being, you're entitled. I was like, but just one thing, you know, a little Columbo style, just one question, just one question. What, how long were you in New York? Because I'm not, it's not adding up here. These stories in the early days are often the parts in histories that get, because, you know, people are dead and like it's a long time ago and it's really hard to nail it down. Those are also often the most important moments in a, somebody's career. And she's like, no, no, we, we lived there for, and now I'm forgetting the answer, um, read the piece. It was either four or six years and the kids went to school there and I was like, I was like, what the fuck? She's like, yeah, we hung out with Lamont Young and, and that had been reported elsewhere. It wasn't all new to me. But I didn't realize like that they lived lived in New York for roughly five years, and they were in the lofts with with Cage and Lamont and all, and like Lamont had given her records, and I was like, okay, wait, 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 whoa. Some of this stuff got got kind of mangled, and it sounded like she had just thought of these long tones out of nowhere. And I'm not saying that Lamont is is responsible for what she does because her thing is absolutely her own, but it didn't come out of nowhere. And I, I read several sort of like potted histories that made it sound like she just heard the helicopter, the plane rotors, and then started making that feedback music. And, and, it, and it wasn't, it was a little bit more logical than that. Anyway, long story to say that, and even now I'm telling you, I'm like, ah, I wish she would, you know, she's still with us. Like I would love to go to Paris and sit down and be like, okay, Elian, Sorry that I ticked you off, whatever, you know. First time we got along, second time she got mad. It happens a lot with artists. I'm like, let's just let's just leave everything after 1969 off the table. Like, let's go year by year, moment by moment. Like, how did, you know, what happened? Armand was, had a dealer in New York, and, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Because also people are people. Like, they just say shit because they want you to get out of their fucking face and let them get back to, you know, eating dinner or whatever. And so, and she especially doesn't like 
really love going into detail about stuff. So she might have just gotten something wrong. You know, she's also fairly old. Like, it, to get something right takes, like, more and more openness and patience. And so that, all of that leads me to believe, like, I really don't know anything about anything. So when somebody wants me to, like, be an expert about anything, I think early on I was like, oh, yes, I would, lo I would love to appear and tell you all about fill in the blank, you know, Pharrell or Timbaland. Now I'm like... Uh, I'll tell you about something I that I was there for that I really know. But other than that, like there, you know, some nerd will pop up and be like, "Here are the greatest unreleased Pharrell beats," and I'll be like, "Shit, I thought I knew all of them." Then I'll be like, "I don't know any of these thirty-seven beats. Like, what yeah. am I talking about?" Like, yeah. you know, you know what I mean? Like, so that that's like an enforced humility, and partially having a gig like the New Yorker means that people are always coming at you and throwing shit at you and. Mm. First response is to be defensive and duck, and then the second response is like, "Okay, well, you got a point there. Like that's true. Yeah. Like you were right, and that and that means I have a different attitude about the gig than I did, you know, 25 years ago when I didn't even know it's going to be a gig." That's really interesting because you, you know, in my experience with like TikTok being so instant, you can the the versions of getting letters sent in as people, right. you know, abusing you in the comments and and picking right. your your appearance and your your surroundings apart or whatever um but it it happened uh in the new yorker and it happened um you know with with passionate people sending in um sure. handwritten or, or typed up notes or whatever how you make me you think had about people, you had a funny thing about people in your discord making little memes of you and <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's like I think that's like i think that's really healthy that people like you have to instantly get a thick skin and have a sense of humor about yourself and take and roll with it. Cause like, you know, you have a lot of people watching what you do. You like what you do. You put out a lot of stuff. And if you were a real like crybaby about it, like you wouldn't be able to do it. You'd have to like fold up your little, your little kickstand, you know, whatever and say like, ah, fuck it. But you know, you don't do that. You just roll with it and you get, you know, in the best, in the best part of the internet, real posters, they, and I think Fantano is amazing at this, like, or Doja Cat, I think is one of my favorite examples. Like, so much shit gets thrown at them, and then like, and they just roll with it and like make it funny and throw it back and just you know they stay in the trenches. And yeah. I'm not 100 percent sure I could do that. It's um, intense. I it's... I think you're quite good at rolling with all that, but you know, also your fans seem to largely like you and appreciate what you're doing, but you probably got some nasty stuff I don't know about. So. Oh, big time, big time. I think it's like, I don't have a thick skin. It's more like you just hear the same things or you get a bit more cautious about how you present things. Right. And it, usually it's about the fact that I wasn't there at the time and and therefore- Oh, really? Yeah, and therefore like the legitimacy of, like I don't, I don't try to purport, I don't purport to be like a historian. I just love the music that I've discovered and built a relationship over but time. Give me an example, what, what would somebody say? Uh, and I look, looking back on this one, I, I actually, I understand. So eighties, like D train, right. You know, eighties yeah. R and B, uh, of that ilk <laughs> that my shit was, that was R and B. Right. Sure. But when I discovered it, um, in the mid two thousands, it was presented to me as post disco and I didn't, I didn't know it as anything else, right? So when I pr made this video, I made a playlist of it and I said, some people call it R&B, some people call it lo lots of different things and I listed out those things to try to cover my butt. Okay. But I started with people don't talk enough about post-disco and people like people do talk, people will come at me, people do talk about it. You, you, who are you, this guy that wasn't there, it's played oh, everywhere. Lord. And it, it, oh, it got very like, almost like I was, uh, yeah, racist or like, many other things and I there was a Wikipedia page that's dedicated to it that's like captures it as this genre and I'm like well at least I have that to fall back on with the, the genre being post disco which is I understand I, it's contentious if you know, I don't even know what that it means to be honest with right? you but. And, and, and that's the thing I, I understand it now because I don't think I ever could have gotten out of it at the time because like I heard of it as that the 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 kind of distillation of it for what it's worth on Wikipedia right. is that mm -hmm. I understand it wasn't that and acknowledged it, okay, but still wasn't good enough because I probably should have called it eighties R and B. But then it's like a, a lot of vitriol came from that, and and definitely has made me more cautious okay. about how to talk about genres and eras that I wasn't a part of. 
not to get bogged down in the weeds of this particular dispute, but what can you give me an example of what else post disco would be? Uh, it's it's very much like synthesized um, R and B, like danceable R and B from the eighties. Okay. Yeah. I'm cu- um, I'm curious just because I I'm obsessed. I mean, this is the moment of my my teendom, and I'm obsessed. I think I possibly because of the memoir, I've I've really been going back to this moment as and my, and for many many people, the music of your teen years is kind of what you imprint on. But as a musician, so you know, all I was at that time, I was, certainly wasn't thinking about writing about it. But mm. as someone who bought bought a lot of records and made little dance tapes and wanted mm. to figure out. What to, you know, Body Meta, the band I'm in now, is named after an Ornette Coleman record that came out in, um, I don't know, 78, 79, somewhere around there. And like the moment when everything, including early rap, was dance music. Mm. You have all these, these 10, in, you know, these 12 inches and rock bands like Power Station and Thomas Dolby, like there were remixes. You know, there was a moment where everything felt like dance music and you could go to Dance Interior and hear any of the records you'd been listening to during the day, whether it was Kid Creole or Defunct or whatever. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Even sometimes they'd play a Bad Brains track. Like it was all dance music. Uh, and even though, and there was this weird sort of homophobic, terrible disco sucks movement in, in mm. rock that was basically a reaction to, aside from just some pure racism type shit, it was also like, it was so clear that that side was going to win because everybody loved dancing. There were 12 inch mixes of Bruce Springsteen songs. There was Madonna, Prince, like everything was dance music. And when rap became not dance music and it became car music and nodding your head in baggy jeans music, you know, you had this increase maybe in like samples and lyrical, you know, skill and all that. But like, I really missed it being dance Mm. music. As the nineties went on, like that all kind of died and dance music became what people were calling techno or something or vice versa. And, and this huge sort of like beautiful cloud had, had dispersed, but post disco, I would never would have used that term. Cause I, anything that says post, I'm always like starting when and ending when, like, I, I'm yeah. like, I don't get it. I don't like. Yeah. And someone would have called it at that I'm, point. I, I, my guess is that it, it was coined in the UK at some point. And that's how I. It was recent. Cause I've never even heard someone say post disco. And this is really interesting. Fuck people who like, I don't know. That's just like, they want to hear themselves talk and they don't have a point. Like, who the fuck cares what you call it? And like, and even all, even historicity, like if you want to be really invested in periods or periodization, as we say in, in the academy, like that shit is really interesting, but you have to be really disciplined with it. And if you're just trying to start a bar fight in the comments, then like, I don't know, just blocked and reported, bro. Like, move <laughs> on. Like, I, I don't want to hear it. Also, yeah, like, I do need also, to do like, that. D-Train is amazing. I don't, you know, I'm, I'm sure any of, the, I don't know who's still alive in D-Train, but like, yeah, I don't care what you call that. Mm, um, although I'm if you want to use the term like post-disco, it would be interesting if you're trying to trace actually the players and like the actual people involved in disco and see where they went because yeah. one of the things that's amazing about early dance music is that it was, it was still all live musicians until well yes. into the eighties. So yes. you'd have people like, you know, the, the main trumpet player in trig pig bag, I forget his name, Ollie or something. They're all named Ollie, but like <laughs> he shows up on all these other dance records in England. Like there's this great movement of these musicians, Wally mm, Battery, like, cool. all these great people who appear on other people's records. And it's a really beautiful moment. And that's, that's what's interesting about post disco. If you want mm. to think about it, there's a period is that like, it was really all live players well deep into the 80s and it doesn't yes. become fully well, hey, to, you know Mal Rogers is on a K-pop track as of two weeks ago so you bro, know Mal Rogers is on every <laughs> fucking record ever made <laughs> that's the truth I know I don't have much time with you left so I, I, want, I do want, wanted to ask about this in particular before before we go which is sure. listening how you listen to a record an album uh-huh. like Especially, you know, you have a, you know, as a musician, as as a journalist, how do you approach something? How much time do you give it? How much time do you, how many times do you need to listen to it to feel like it's something that you dig, something that is you deem to be important, maybe even deem important enough to write about that you see it as significant? Does it take you a little time, a year, 
how does that process work for you to get to it's that point? It's very, very chaotic and badly organized and dumb. I mean, I think, uh, and when I had a job job doing it, I mean, because I write as much about books and weird stuff now as I do about music, and I don't do that, I don't do that many, like, reviews of albums anymore. Um, I try, you know, Bob Crisco used to um, listen on a, on a Walkman, and uh, about 20 years ago, we were in a, a fellowship together at Columbia, and he, I, I, that, at that point, I didn't even know him that well, and he, you know, he would always have this Walkman playing, and and I, I asked him, like, well, what, what are you doing? Kind of the question you just asked me, I'd be like, what are you up to, Bob? Like, what's the process? And he, you know, he taped records with a cassette, and then he, um, he listened to them on the Walkman, and he had this phrase that has always stuck with me, because he's very, very disciplined. And he would be like, well, I just want to get the listens under my belt. And I was like, what do you mean? And he's like, well, I just want to make sure that I know what I know or that I think what I actually think. And so he would, you know, make sure he listened to an album over and over again until he had an idea because it, it, the real dividing point in, in weighing in on shit, if you're being, you know, hard on yourself in, a, in the right way is like, look, if I don't have anything to say other than I, I like, I like it, like I like it isn't a reason to write something. You want to have some kind of synthetic, you know, you, you've got reporting, you're going to tell people like, this is where Damon Albarn was when he came up with this track. And, or, you know, I wrote about the Gorillaz album and I was like, man, this cartoon vision of LA is kind of making me uncomfortable. Like, I don't love this. Um, but then, but you know, in, in, in that case, it was like, okay, aging and pop. If you come up with a cartoon avatar system, you can make records forever. Like you'll never get old because you're, you know, 2D and Noodle and Murdoch are, you know, always gonna be whatever age you want them to be. So you can make whatever music you want behind that. And that was my idea. Also just that it's weird that someone who was in a band as big as Blur ended up in a band that might be bigger, which is pretty rare. And I did not think that was going to happen. But, you know, I noticed that my kids would be singing like mid-period Gorillaz tracks that I'd never heard. Like my son was uh, the Melancholy Beach, whatever that song is. Um, like I didn't even know that album. I didn't even know they, you know, there were like two or three records I missed. And I'd written about Damon a couple of times and I was like, damn, they just kept going. So anyway, for instance, that process that I just sort of garbled at you led me to being like, okay, there's enough reason for me to engage with it. But the first time I listened to the album, I didn't have any of those ideas. I was just like, oh, it was something as dumb as like, this is kind of unusually, I, I fuck with this. Like, there, I like this. And, but then it's a process of like, do I have anything to say? It's playing in the background. I play a lot of stuff in a big playlist chaotically in a way that would make all the purists mad at me. The audio is bad. The attention is bad. I'm multitasking and making eggs. Like, hmm. But I'm kind of wanting the music to come get me. And, when it, and then I'll listen as I bicycle. I'm like, okay, I can really focus, but I shouldn't be listening when I'm in traffic. That's a bad thing. Don't do that, kids. Oh, I, I did as and well. Like, <laughs> yeah. As, as it goes, it's like, if if it catches if you know if the the ball the ball of tape rolls around and gets enough stuff stuck to it and I seem to have a a thing to say that's not dumb then I'll be like okay maybe we got something here but you know it's a process that involves you know disappointing editors and myself sometimes and being like and canceling things and saying like you know what I I got nothing to say the Arctic Monkeys are fine I I, I can't weigh in I don't know it's great you know and it, it it's not it's not being afraid to like or dislike something because that part's totally uninteresting to me. It's it's like, did anything about it like connect with me? Did it, did it make me think the way, like when I watch survivor now I watch Trump getting elected, not just because Mark Burnett put Trump in the apprentice, but because in the mid period in the like 10 years after it starts, they start putting these awful white men into the show and they get tons of airtime and they're, they're like nasty, disgusting people. I hate watching them. And the producers just like push these guys to the front and they make it all the way to the end of the show. And, you know, you can't, I don't, I'm not saying it's rigged, but like, man, do these terrible people get a lot of airtime. And I'm like, okay, this is interesting. Like, I thought I was just watching a goofy show where my, my TV dad, Jeff Probst, made me feel better. But then I, now I'm like, wow, look at this disgusting thing that popped up in the middle of it. I'm like, okay, yep. The girls are all in bikinis and these terrible older white men are just being 
awful. Like, and then the, the show didn't start there and it didn't end up there recently, but like in the middle of it, there's this pr- really hard to watch four or five year stretch where you're just seeing the worst people in America. Yes. G- given tons of airtime and you're like, oh, here we go. And that's where this, uh, an idea like that crystallizes is, is that sort of observation. A guy um, named Russell Hance. Yeah, that's, that's, that's when I'm like, okay, I, I can, not that anyone needs me to weigh in on Survivor, but ha ha. I, no, I, let <laughs> I, I really relate to that because I have a big note for my, like I've, I put all my TikTok ideas in like a reminder, like in the, the notes app in Apple Notes yeah. app. Shout but I have a big, yep. And I have this big all caps thing that says like, like, am I saying anything original or new? Right. To, like that I believe hasn't been thought about. And all the stuff that has worked for me is the stuff where I'm stitching together different experiences where I'm listening to this. I'm also eating that. And right. the weather's like that. And I go, I, I think I see something here that I don't think anyone's talked about. And people lean in on that idea of, uh, of me not just going like, yeah, you should check out John Coltrane because I like jazz. It's like, yeah, good for you. But if I can weave a story that is actually from something that I just sparks a bit of excitement in me and I tell that, there's that transference which connects with people that uh, you can't, isn't just an opinion. It's It's a whole bunch of different things all wrapped into one. So I really relate to that as a I think it's, method that you have. I think it's interesting, especially seeing people on TikTok who will um, start with a moment of doubt and they'll be open and vulnerable and they'll say, like, here's this, this sacred figure, John Coltrane, and they'll be like, you know, open open enough to say like, I don't know who the fuck this guy is. Like, why do people like this guy? And then they go on a journey. Of course, there's somebody instantly in the comments saying, oh my God, what was... Okay, there's a very funny newish Hannibal Buress thing where he goes on, um, he's on T Pain's little podcast and he's got this sampler and he makes fun of early rap cadence and it's so funny and perfect. And I've watched that over and oh, hip hop started out in the park. We break <laughs> dance, we see our friends. And it's like <laughs> so fucking on point and funny. And of course, the comments are instantly full of people being like, you must respect the originators. And it's like, dude. Mm, like, it's ragtime. <laughs> like, come on. Exactly. It's like, he does respect the originators. He's just funny. And I'm like, thank God people like that ignore the comments because it's, it's, um, or what's the other one? There's another one. I mean, they're basically making fun of like my early heroes. And I love it. Like, there's a, there's another guy who does, I don't know. He's not Hannibal Bress. I don't know his name, but he, he has a series of like making fun of older rap that are totally brilliant. He does sort of a slick Rick one where he's like, the punchline is every fish has gills. And he's like <laughs> talking about like when your parents play their favorite rap. And I was like, Oh my God. And like, it's really well done. Um, yeah. That kind of stuff is like, I love seeing stuff that I took for granted and thought was genius. Have some, you know, it's, it's like that. It's like the kombucha girl meme. Like at first you're like, stop. And then you're like, well, you're right. Like, like true. It, it did sound like that. Didn't it? Yeah. And like all these, all these wars where like things were like, oh my God, the difference between like Slick Rick and Dougie Fresh, incredibly important. Dana Dane, no, hold on, let me break it down for you. But of course, like 20, 30 years later, it's like, yeah, it does kind of sound the same. Yeah. <laughs> and like whatever was goofy about it, like, oh, it's really goofy now. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, I love, I love people going on that, on that journey and, um, like you said, like just starting with starting with a like I was just thinking the other day about how when Bjork quit the Sugar Cubes, um, who I just I saw her live with Sugar Cubes, which I didn't really appreciate at the time. I was just like I was like ah, she's so much better than the band. And about a week ago, I saw a clip on TikTok, and I was like, wait a minute, Mister Young and Opinionated. I bet if I went back now, I would love the Sugar Cubes, and I would be like, shit, they were great. Like, why was I so mad about Einar and his trumpet? Like, damn, like, you know what I mean? Like, it's sometimes the most interesting thing you can do with your own expressions is like, you have like a little pack of opinions to stomp around with. And then you're like, what if I'm just wrong? Like, what if I'm 100% wrong about something? Let me go back to something that I'm convinced, like, that I don't like, like the doors. And I'll be like, all right, let me, let me see what's going yeah. on here with, with the Mr. Doors. 
Not sure that one's going to change, but you never know. <laughs> I'm somewhat similar on that, but I, I let's leave it there. I think that is a beautiful way to put it because I... Keyboards are cool. <laughs> Keyboards are cool? Yeah, I mean, Ray Manzer. <laughs> Manzer? Oh, key, the keyboard. Sorry, yes, yes, yes. The, uh, the keyboards are cool. Um, he produced the first X record. I, uh, it, it's, it's, it's been such a, you know, it's, it's so great to hear how you think, because I, I think similarly, and I think that it's, uh, it's really great to know that I, what I inspires me most about how you think is like, I, you said this on the aquarium drunkard podcast, you're getting younger every day. And I do feel that. And I do feel like, the more I think about and approach this stuff, the more I, I have faith in, in, you know, music and in and youth and and change and 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 yeah. it, it is laughing at yourself. It is, uh, you know, not taking it so seriously that you've, like you said, the backpack of opinions because it's like right. you just end up looking like a fool. I think when you when you you know hold on too tight. Um, yeah, that's when I'll you start living in the last- comments. Go. recommendation i yeah. i recommend your all of your products i endorse them go derek g but also um i think the fastest way to cut and this is a fairly newish thing from the last few years but the fastest way to see just how healthy and how music is always okay is the uh, dust to digital instagram account it okay. might be the same on tiktok but like you know people send in videos and every couple of days, they'll post, you know, a gallery of 10 videos of people from all over the world playing all these different instruments and like shredding and singing. And like, man, there is no lack of totally sick ways to play music. And and also being reminded of how global the whole thing is. Mm. I, I find it a very good tonic to like watch every single one of those videos. Sometimes I'm impatient. I don't want to because it'll be like two minutes of someone in a trio in Bulgaria singing. And I'm like, I don't want to watch that. But then I kind of make myself eat my vegetables and I watch these videos. And it just reminds me that like the number of people making incredible music is, is so staggeringly high. And that like, if you get too caught up in the genius, you know, Prince, Miles Davis, James yeah. Brown, Joni Mitchell theories, like, sure, those people are amazing. And it's fun to study them. But like, there's somebody just kicking ass right now on like a fucking vi- xylophone somewhere and like it's it's really good to just and also as a musician just stay humble anytime you think you've ripped off something you've just like burned it like you'll tune in you'll see some 10 year old on a piano you'll be like oh man she <laughs> smokes me like I'm, I'm nobody she just, she just killed it I, I just i think it's good to to sort of return to the frame as often as you can and be like you know it's fine everyone's everyone's making music I appreciate your wisdom. I think that everyone that listens to this podcast listens to a lot of music, but then likes to make sense of it as well. And I think that there's so many things that you could just clip up and quote from what you just said. So, uh, nice. Sasha Fred Jones, I appreciate Ooh. you a lot, and thank you for doing Derek this, and G. thank you for your support. It's been uh, it's been amazing. Thank you, and man. Th- thank you. And your book, the memoir, is earlier. October. Cop it October. Actually, it was going to be October 24th. It might be, no pun intended, earlier. Uh, there's something else coming out the same day. We're trying to like put some space between them. But anyway, right now it's October 24th. Book is called Earlier from the Mighty Semiotex. Cop it. Hell get yeah. the shirt. Get Hell the yeah. towel. Oh, yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll do some TikToks on it. Come on. Nice. <laughs> thank you, Sasha. And thank you, everyone. Thank you, man. See you.